Podcasting from Astrolab Studios, this is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we revisit sci-fi, fantasy, and just plain weird shows that have faded from the collective consciousness and didn't quite make the impact that they intended. This week, Space Above and Beyond, episodes 16 and 17. Neil, what's your six with Eric? First you tell me not to enlist, and now you're telling me what to do? The guy thinks he's John Wayne. Who? I've seen his kind before, all right? Long gone, gung-ho, with nothing to back it up except a squad of men. He's my CO. Doesn't mean he knows what he's doing. Well, how do I know you know what you're doing? Uh, the only fight I've ever seen you in was with Craig McPherson when he asked Kylan to the winter dance. Look, Nathan, I, I may be a rookie, but one look around here, I can tell this ain't no winter dance. I've been through a lot, Neil. I've seen a lot. All right, Herrick's never even seen battle. He's got a lot to learn. Don't be his guinea pig. He'll learn it with your life, my life, and the life of everyone your buddies. You've been in the court twice as long as here. Some girls quarterback in your team. She's ten times the Marine Herrick will ever be. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. Look, I'm trying to keep you from getting killed. Why can't you just let me lose? Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that is reminding you to set your clocks back an hour because Daylight Savings Day was two days ago and you've been very late for work. Is it? Is that what? Is that when this is airing? <laughs> yeah, that's when this is airing. I had to look uh, up in a calendar because I had nothing else to say this morning. <laughs> I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan, and this week we have a guest. Sharon, welcome aboard the podcast. Thank you. She's very, very <laughs> tentative. I'm just and as waiting. I said, Sher- Sharon's having a tea and is our first guest that is doing it hugging a cushion. Yeah, it's I'm like very we're having a sleepover. It's because fall is coming and I just want to be comfortable. Fair enough. I'm wearing it- a sweater too. I took off my sweater. It's very hot in here. Do you find it hot? Am I the only one? Remember that one time we came in here? It was all moody. What happened? It wasn't some moody at all anymore. No, we just stopped turning the lights off. Oh, that's what it was. Oh, that's too bad. Do you want to? You want to make it moody? It I'll might pa- be I'll fun. Pause the podcast. Hold on, no, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll turn the light up. Hold it, let's see. And we're back. <laughs> and it's much moodier. It it's is moodier so now. nice. Is it better now? So much more aligned with my fallness. <laughs> All right, Sharon. I'm not sure how much you know about the podcast, but I was curious... Were you a fan of science fiction television? Like, is this a thing you watched much growing up or even now? No, I don't watch a lot of science fiction. I think now I watch more science fiction than I did as a kid. So I didn't I didn't know this show at all. No. Is sci-fi just not for you? That's a really big statement. I just need stories to be more grounded so I can relate to them. What do you like better, a robot or an alien? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer that. Well, they're both, they both could be real. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Jordan doesn't believe in robots. <laughs> yeah, only aliens. <laughs> a robot? Give me a break. <laughs> All right. Machine can't have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've said you've never heard of this show before. No. Well, when it came out, these, these two episodes we watched would have come out uh, February and March of 1996. So uh, what would have young Sharon have been up to if she wasn't watching these shows? I was in grade six and attending this art school in February and March. That's very specific. Um, <laughs> yeah, to roll down into your memory. Yeah, you just remember what assignment you were doing in school. That's specific. You know what? In grade six, this is totally random and it may have happened in February, but I remember a friend of mine told me that <laughs> it was a PA day and then I didn't show up to school. Because I told my mom it was PA day. And then I came back to school on Tuesday and then it wasn't a PA day. It was very embarrassing. Sharon, this is like a friend. I just remember that now. <laughs> That's a hilarious prank. Wait, let me ask you though. I don't think she meant it as a prank. I think she just... Did she go to school that day? She did. But I don't think that she was trying to tell me. But here's the thing. I bet you had a great day off though, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I had a really good day off. But then everybody laughed at me. And it, I didn't really even get in trouble because I genuinely believed it was a day off. 
I love it. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Very heartwarming. That's what I was doing. Skipping school. Unintentionally skipping Unintentionally school. Unintentionally. <laughs> while Space and Beyond was on TV. You were such, you were such a bad girl by accident. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the episodes and uh, we can have a little bit of chat and see what you thought of uh, this show that you've never heard of before. A show that's almost 20 years old, right? Well, it, 20 years old. Yeah. I did the math. Yeah. 21 years old. There you go. Yeah. In your head. Yeah. Like a robot. Mm-hmm. Like an alien. All right. Here is the IMDb synopsis for episode 16, Toy Soldiers. Rookie squad accompany the 58th on a simple recon mission. Gung Ho, untested rookie squad commander, makes reckless decisions against standing orders. West's kid brother is under his command. That summary was courtesy of Keith is me. Ah, Keith is back. He's he's our favorite uh, person who seems to write a lot of uh, synopsis for on IMDb. Really? Yeah, it may be Keith for Sutherland. Ooh. He's written probably more than half of the ones we've read. Actually, why do you think it's him? Well, because the name is Keith is me. But now that I think about it, I actually think it's Ross of Sutherland. His brother. <laughs> Why would he go by his? <laughs> because he's jealous. He's jealous of his brother's success. So he uses his name. Yeah, yeah. He's like, actually, I'm Keith. Yeah, exactly. Keith That's what it is. is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, and we'll see what you guys thought of this. This was weird, right? Every single commercial break the show went to came back with another quote. Yeah, it was. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought that was the format of the show. No, I've no. never seen that in a television. Like. You, I'm used to like kind of like that cold open where you have text on a black screen giving you a quote to like set you up for an episode. But almost every time it came back from commercial break, there's another one. It was um, Red Badge of Courage. Quotes from Red Badge of Courage, Robert Louis Stevenson and Eugene Levine. Do you know who any of these people are? I read Red Badge of Courage when I was a kid, weirdly. And I, I don't really have any memory of it other than I know it's a war book, but I actually don't even remember what war. Well, I kind of made this assumption that they were you know, army, war people. You're not wrong. Uh, the one that really stood out to me, I looked into Eugene Levine. Apparently he was one of the communists in Russia that kind of read the re- led the revolution or something. Hmm. It was hmm. it was odd because the other ones were like Red Bridge of Courage is clearly a military book about someone who's had cowardice and wants to do good again. And then Robert Louis Stevenson is obviously the author who's written what Robinson Crusoe and... Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Jordan, that's, you must that's, have, that's the big one. Yeah, you must have read those books. You feel? You feel I read. Like I read. That. I read. What's, what was that first one you said? <laughs> Robinson Crusoe. I read that one. So? Yep. I read that one. But yeah, it was. It was just weird. <laughs> I've never seen a show have so many quotes in a single episode. It was. This show has a tendency to, every now and then, it'll kind of break format, but in a way that I don't know if it works. And like, I and I'm trying to think of an example where it's done that before. Like, it's done this sort of title cards before, but every now and then they'll just be like, "What if we just try this?" And it seems like it never quite works i i don't know i don't know if it worked or didn't work on this episode because i didn't think this was a great episode but it was a weird lot of talk. what did, it was it, weird so yeah, it was weird there it, you go so actually when the episode opened i was like okay they're doing this like close-up thing and yeah this guy's getting his head shaved yeah and they're introducing this character and then i was like waiting for a wide for the whole episode i don't know if you noticed but the whole episode is like close-ups Here's, here's what I noticed. The guy at the beginning who's getting his hair cut, they have him then saluting at one point. Did you notice how freakishly long his fingers were? Was no. I the only one? They were like, I mean, I look, I don't have gigantic hands, I realize, but his hands were like three times the size of my hands. I would never have cast that guy. Get those weird, freaky hands out of the way anyways. Clearly get, you have a personal... Uh, personal problem with people with large guy. hands? Yes. Look at that guy in his big hands. <laughs> it's all jealousy. Big hand jealousy. <laughs> You got those little hands. Yeah. Well, they're, I mean, I think they're normal size, but he had like, do you know what? I'm telling you, go back and rewatch it. They're creepily long. I want to get back actually, because Sharon, it's interesting you said that. I did notice they were all in close ups when they're introducing this new character. And I assumed it was just because, you know, they just shot him and didn't actually have anything around him. So they're like, just keep close. Mm-hmm. We're not going to fill up the scene. But you're kind of right. They don't ever really cut too many wides on the show. And I wonder if it's just because the sets are so small that there's just no wides to could go be. to. It could be, yeah. Maybe. Or just the sets don't look great in wides? Well, I certainly was like, oh my goodness, why is it all in close-ups? But then the next episode wasn't. So yeah. it was like, oh, maybe it was just that one director. Yeah, maybe it was just decisions. I mean, this character we're meeting that Sharon's talking about, that Jordan hates his long fingers, mm-hmm. 
is uh, the big reveal is it's Neil West, our lead character, West's younger brother. And mm-hmm. we've seen him one but one time before in a previous episode, Sharon, where uh, actually I think it was the first episode where we, where they went back to uh, the very beginning when he West first joins the military, him and Vanson, for some weird reason, go back to his kind of futuristic home because this takes place in 20, what is it, 63? 64. 2064. All oh, right, because New Year's already happened. <laughs> in that Christmas episode. But uh, but you see the brother in there. But is this the same actor playing the brother? I'm not sure, actually. I don't think it is. My guess is it's not. You noticed his long fingers. I'll tell you what I noticed about him. Because they cut to a shot of his face. And I was like, oh, look at this very West dweeby kind of white guy they have. But then he spoke. And he has the deepest voice I've ever heard. Like it, I was like off put by how deep his voice mm. was. It does not look like it's coming to that young man. Hmm. Huh. That's what bothered me, not his fingers, his, yeah, his I, deep, deep voice. I was still looking at those fingers. <laughs> long, long. I didn't notice anything strange about He's, him. He seemed perfectly normal to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you only become friends with people with long fingers. You told me that before. <laughs> it's like a weird thing of yours. Isn't there a disclaimer that says that anything Jordan says can't be trusted? <laughs> I mean, there should be if there isn't. Yeah, mm. so here it is now. <laughs> that you only like people with long fingers? You afraid that people might think that's true? You should hear what he says about me on this show. Oh, okay. It's supposed to be on his toes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, getting back to the show, uh, Neil, West's younger brother, has just come to the Saratoga. He's part of this rookie squad, the fifth recon force. And when he bumps into West and his pals, West kind of chews him out for being new meat. But they have a pretty cordial relationship, I think. It's, uh, it seems like the two of them get along pretty well. He's kind of happy to see his brother, though he's you know a little worried that his brother is going into war, but... What's he going to do about it? And that kind of just sets up the episode. We kind of know it's going to be Wes dealing with his younger brother who's Mm -hmm. joining the military and kind of what that's going to mean. What we kind of see is the fifth is just arriving. They have a rookie commanding officer named Lieutenant Herrick. And this guy's like very interested in like glory. Like he's fresh out of the academy, just like Neil himself is. They're very excited to be there. They just want to prove themselves in battle. Their commander loves to yell at them. He reminded me of one of my cousins, (laughs) actually. Anyways, we'll leave that at that. (laughs) Yeah, we'll leave that in the podcast. Yeah, like, the it doesn't co- matter. The commander that was yelling at the lineup of men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. do you remember him? He was like, I thought they were doing like a drill sergeant. Like he was, the, and I guess he was acting that way, but it wasn't like, I thought maybe that was their training, but it was just, that's how their leader yeah, treats them. He's like an, a fresh officer, fresh of the academy, I think. I think you see this in like a uh, Vietnam sort of story or something, like a right. guy who just wants to prove himself and move up the ranks or something. I did like, he had a great nickname for um, Neil when he was yelling at them. What was it? He called him a cake boy. <laughs> I didn't catch that. I like that. Yeah. A little cake boy. A little cake boy. I mean, the best part was when he got yelled at. That's true. McQueen comes in and then like kind of dresses him down for being such a hothead. And this and and uh, in front of the other men. I, that was the point, I think. Right. Yeah. That was the point is to go, oh, you think you're a big guy? Well, I'm a bigger guy. And then weirdly, right after that, someone came and dressed down McQueen. And then after that, someone and dressed down that guy. Remember? That didn't happen. Hmm. So a Russian nesting doll <laughs> yeah. and dressing down. Yeah. Imagine the whole episode was just that. Another person comes and they yell at that person. Like, God, how long is this going to go on for? <laughs> the basic plot of the episode is that um, they get a call in for a mission. They're going to send it down to a planet, do some recon. But the wild cards who are our leads don't have any support. So Neil and his little squad of misfits are going to join them to kind of support them on this very nothing mission. They're just going down there to like watch the aliens see what they do, and then report back. Like, it's it's a very simple setup to this episode. Like, we're going to go down, we're going to look at these things, we're going to come back. And you get a pretty clear sense that Neil and this Lieutenant Herrick, they really want to fight something, so you know it's going to go wrong pretty much immediately. Almost mm-hmm. every episode, they send the team down on a pretty much nothing mission. Almost always. And you always know something's going to... Because they're like, this, this mission is, uh, you guys are going to get some sand. Next mission, you guys are going to look at clouds. And you're like, well, something's going to happen. They can't just be looking at clouds. And then that was another of this. Well, they were just watching, watching to see if the chigs were doing anything like perverts. <laughs> that was their mission. That's something I was not expecting. Like, you don't see any science fiction. Like, you just see You see a planet. Them. You see, like, some ships landing. But it is it is more of a military show. It's a mili- militaristic yeah. science fiction. And and I think you're what you're maybe pointing to is you barely see the the people they're fighting right yeah only exactly. in shadows only in glimpses i think part of that is by design that 
through the whole show, you've learned very little about who they're fighting. You you see them occasionally and stuff, but we've learned almost nothing of their culture or right. uh, tech, a little bit about their technology and things. But I think also in more practical sense, I think they look kind of silly. The suits when they're when they're lit really well, mm -hmm. and so I think that's it's a little bit of both that they keep them in shadows and they look a little bit more menacing because when mm -hmm. they're in the daylight, you're like look at those kind of clunky Power Rangers esque sort of uh, costumes they're wearing. Mm. They're on the planet and. West is very worried about this commanding officer. That's kind of the premise of this episode. He's worried that this guy is going to get his brother killed. He's a hothead. So West, in classic fashion, because he wants to talk to his brother and they're two different trenches, he breaks a piece of equipment in his own trench mm -hmm. just so he has an excuse to make his brother like crawl across the battle lines to give him a replacement. One, that's classic West of doing something very selfishly, but two... How did he know that his brother was going to be the one that was going to come over? I guess maybe his brother because was Because the... it's very conveniently written in the script. I suppose. But I mean, in terms of the actual <laughs> world we're well, living he told, in. He says, send West. Oh, you're right. Right. Oh, uh, there you go. Well, that answered my question. So. There you go. It, very good. Pay yeah. attention. It's sustained. <laughs> Jordan was half asleep probably when he watched I was. One. I was half asleep. But yeah, it, <laughs> it is classic West. And basically the scene is just for them to have a heart to heart where he's just like, you know, don't follow that guy. It's it's He's a hothead. Be very careful. Don't go chasing glory. You know, everything mm -hmm. that we've been saying so far. But what was great about it is they're both mic'd and the mics are hot. Yeah, why was that? And everyone Isn't can hear what the they're radio. saying. But then she, his colleague got so mad at him about that yeah. later. And the hothead lieutenant who he's badmouthing can hear everything he's saying. That's weird that they didn't turn their mics off. But more importantly, Luke, do you remember in a previous episode, that was the whole plot line was that the Chigs could hear their microphones. Yeah. Remember, so why would they just, why would they ever even have them uh, be open? They haven't learned a single lesson this entire show, or West yeah. hasn't anyway. West hasn't. But I thought he wanted them to hear. Oh, you think so? Yeah. You think he was trying to get that message? Because why did he have his brother meet him halfway? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I see, I don't, I don't know if he did. See, I thought, it's funny that you, you watched it that way, because I didn't think he wanted people to hear. I think it was just a... They're accidentally on and they're having this very personal conversation and everyone is just sort of convenient that everyone can hear this personal conversation. But that girl... Vanson. Was like, what, you pulled that with the... Like, why did you pull that with the... Yeah, breaking the equipment. Oh, shoot. Okay, never mind. Oh, you thought she was just like, why did you do that stupid hot mic trick? Yeah. I, yeah, maybe she did. That's interesting. I, I'm not 100% sure. It was weird that they did that and then the conversation they have is... Um, at first, I thought I was going to like his little brother more than I was going to like West. West has been a character we haven't typically enjoyed very much. Mm -hmm. But Neil comes off as such a dickhead. Yeah. He's like defending his commander, which is fine. He can defend his commander. But he literally says of Vanson, who's the lead of West Squad, he says, you've got some girl quarterbacking your team. And I'm just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's. It, I think it might be a bit of a problem of this episode is that they introduce a new character. He's never, let's pretend you didn't see him ever before in a flashback or whatever, but it's a new character. We don't really learn much about him and mm -hmm. you don't really have a reason as an audience to care about him. So spoiler alert, he's going to die in this episode because you can see it from a mile away from the beginning of the episode. But I don't think as a viewer, anyone cares because it's like, oh, this character, we don't know anything about care about. He died. Oh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, you know, and at least that's how I felt. It was, and and he, yeah, he kind of crumb. He's a kind of a whiny jerk. It's like, all right, good. I'm glad he's dead. I kind of assumed that we cared people a lot cared about this guy, about this, this, these two brothers, you know. And then with all the flashback stuff of them running in the field, like, oh yeah. Let me mention one thing, Luke. That was did the you, only wide. Did you notice? <laughs> did you notice, Luke, that even in the past, their face was dirty? No. Because you're always obsessed with people's how, dirt, how dirty their faces. Oh my goodness, faces. I noticed that too. The dirt was like very <laughs> makeup dirt. Yeah, their faces yeah. are always filthy for some reason. I don't know why. Because of it's the camel... pollution in the air. <laughs> oh, I th oh, that's a different... I, mean, I think it's just bad um, camouflage. And you think it's the pollution in the air on these... By the way, how many different quarry-looking planets are they going to go to? Every time they go to a planet now, it's the same stupid quarry planet. It's hard to find locations. I right? guess. <laughs> anyway. I assume that the future is very polluted. Just on every planet? Everywhere. This is not on, they're not on Earth. Yeah, everywhere is polluted. Oh, everywhere. Hmm. And that's why they look like quarries. <laughs> it could be. It could be. <laughs> I like the theory. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this, this sort of opened my conversation that everyone hears this Lieutenant Herrick 
uses it to rally his troops be like see they don't respect us we should do something to prove ourselves and they just so happen to see like a communication satellite thing that the chigs have set up at some distance they're just supposed to watch and they're like we're gonna go out there we're gonna blow that up we're gonna prove that we're like cool military guys just like everybody else and they all wear uh, goggles in this episode and what's funny about the goggles is i don't think they fit any of the actor's face and so and they're just too big and you they clearly no one can see out of these goggles and they keep putting them on and i i don't know what in in the world of the show those goggles are supposed to be doing because they're just black like there's just black glass so it's just like hold on let me pull this down before i shoot and like there's no way you can see it of those things I made, <laughs> I made the same note is they look so ill-fitting. I think yeah. they're supposed to be night vision goggles, but some of them fit better. Some of them are like seem to be on the edge of their nose. They like, look like my goodness. I, I was watching and I said to Laura, I said, don't <laughs> you think don't you think that one guy looks like a cenobite? Do you remember in, Hell, in Hellraiser? You know those weird little people, the one guy's spiky face? There's one really creepy guy with little glasses. He looks just like that. I'll put it on Instagram. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so everyone can enjoy my reference. <laughs> That's you, so funny. I can't believe you noticed those things. Well, I mean, they were in the last two episodes, and it's the first time they've ever used those weird goggles. And I'm like, man, just don't fit. They just don't fit the actors. But it's because you were distracted at how tight the shots were the whole time. Yeah. You were obsessing. I really was obsessing. <laughs> but pull out. I was just like, pull out. still. And I was like, <laughs> I also hate close ups that are unnecessary. So, but so much of it was like extreme close up. Maybe, in this episode. Maybe they just didn't finish building sets for this episode. They're like, just stay real close on everybody. I, I think you're right what you said originally. I think it was just a director's choice. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's also this, like, brotherly thing. But, I, it, but I mean, that's not most of the episode. Like, what we find no. out coming up here is this rookie squad goes out to this calm satellite. They're going to blow it up to prove themselves. But when they get there, it's just a decoy. It was set up specifically to draw them out so that the aliens could get the drop on them. And immediately they're basically pinned down and they've revealed their location. The wild cards have to call in a broken arrow and get like support to come down and evacuate them because basically they've blown the entire mission. It's These are the episodes I, I think I've made it clear. These are the episodes that I like the least. This sort of really hard military trench warfare sort of just shooting and yelling and stuff. I don't find it terribly interesting. And in this episode for large large amounts of time was just people shooting and things exploding and i just don't find that terribly interesting as a viewer um and also weirdly after we had a couple episodes that really brightened things up and had a little bit more uh, just a different look to it this episode went back to the very harsh realmy browns and grays that i'm not a big fan of for whatever reason i don't mm -hmm. know if it was filmed before but i was just like ugh, just turn on a light or something down there i i mean as as the first episode that I watched in this series, I found it really difficult to engage and to be interested because I didn't know what it was about. I knew it was about these two brothers. I didn't care about the brothers. I didn't know who the bad guys were. There was a lot of like shoot fighting that and I wasn't sure what they were doing and why and well, a lot of it's. Of I mean, that. that's what ha when they get pinned down here and it's clear they've been walked into a trap because they're dummies. Mm -hmm. They're even called back. They're like, "Hey, retreat and come back," and they're still like, "No, let's stay here." I think if we keep fighting, then we'll prove it. Like, yeah, it, they've already messed up, and the idea would be, okay, now just come back. Like, but they just double down on this bad idea. So now we just have to keep seeing them fight, mm -hmm. and like their commanders, like, let's run over the barricade and just run straight at them and he's like immediately shot and injured so we kind of are left with this rookie group without their commander and slowly like every one of the rookies gets murdered but the the um uh i don't know what his name is steve the leader of the herrick er herrick yeah it's eric with an h h-e-r-r-i-c-k oh his name is herrick that's new it's very like scandinavian anyway <laughs> um herrick uh, he doesn't die right away, though, doesn't? Don't you see no, later in the trenches injured. he's injured, right? Yeah, yeah, he's just injured. He's the only one who doesn't die. Right, of course. Classic jerk. He gets everyone else killed, you know? But it basically ends with Neil, West's little brother. He's the last one left alive. And I think at some point he's like a real action star. He's got two handguns, one in each hand, and he's just like shooting them both at the aliens. Yeah. It's really dumb. The, well, the point is, though, it was a bad decision. You're right. They doubled down. They're now stuck there, and the central conflict that they had with these two brothers and Wes doesn't want his younger brother being in the war. Now, Wes is trying to get there to save him, and time is running out. But I think, as Sharon mentioned earlier, 
I don't know if that sort of tension or emotional resonance really works worked at all in this episode because I didn't really care. But I'll also mention I watched this at midnight last night, so I was tired and also so I was just like, let's just get through this, you know. But I also don't know like when the, he made that decision. I wasn't like, oh my god, that's so foolish because I didn't know how powerful the opponent was, you know, and right. like. I don't know who they're fighting and what the stakes are. I mean, there weren't stakes. Like, they were... Yeah, so why not? Like, it wasn't clear to me that it was a stupid thing. You mean if they ran, over the, they ran over the trench and you saw it was just children on the other side, you'd be like, that was a good idea. <laughs> Everyone could beat these children. Well, I think, I mean, I think maybe to that point is, you know, they weren't, like, it's quite, they make it quite clear that they're not supposed to disobey, disobey orders, and they're quite clearly disobeying right. orders. That seems to be right. less about who the opponent is. It was really just setting up, look at these people, disobey orders, and now they're going to get punished for it. Right. There yeah. was a, a, a strong uh, underlining theme of just obeying orders, you know, and that's how the military, this show is, the mm-hmm. show really does push sort of militaristic ideas a lot of times. It's, v- it's very pro-military. Mm-hmm. For for better or worse, um, and this episode really did push that following orders and doing everything the proper way keeps you alive. Keeps you alive. Don't if you're a rookie, you just have to do your best and do your time. And like that's the idea. And you know, there's a whole race across the battlefield so West can get to there to save his brother. But when he gets there, his brother's already dead, and that's kind of leaves us in this moment where he's just like crying over his brother's body. Like his worst fears have been realized. And I mean, this will be new to you, Sharon. But this West character from very early on, his character has been set up as a guy who goes rogue, disobeys orders, ignores the safety of his own squad all of the time. Almost every mm-hmm. episode. And his brother's doing the exact same thing he always does this episode. Like it runs in the family. But the funny thing is they don't point that out. You would think the writers would have noticed like this is a family trait. You know what I mean? We just, you know, in the West family, they just do their own thing. And that's just that's just what they're like. But they never have that inner sort of reflection of the character of him sort of seeing himself going oh no i can see what's going to happen now because my brother's just like me it they don't they sort of miss all those interesting character points to this and mm-hmm. so you just end up with two kind of bland characters and then so like we said when the death happens there's no real resonance at all no actually you know what was funny as i was watching it part of me kind of hoped it wouldn't have redeemed the entire episode but part of me kind of hoped that what they were going for is we we're supposed to think he was going to die they managed to save him in time but he gets court-martialed or something or like there's some sort of like humiliation that comes out of this like his character's forced to face repercussions for disobeying orders like there was going to be something like that i thought it was going to be about that west had to learn to accept his brother's life choices you know that like mm-hmm. oh your brother you know he sees his brother as a certain way but his brother's grown up now and he has to come to come to accept that but they didn't do that either yeah i told that's what i was expecting too that was the setup they did and they tried to resolve it by them just having a conversation like just accept your brother for being different he's like okay and then like they just killed him so it could be sad it was weird i obviously this episode was a bit of a a mess and certainly you're right jordan reflected back to early season episodes where they just just couldn't land the story they Mm -hmm. like would pick up an idea and then forget about it and then kind of go the most obvious direction with it yeah so not not a great episode for sharon to to watch as her first episode (laughs) sorry sharon it's okay it's all good (laughs) <laughs> Sharon's going to sleep right now everybody She's having a little nap <laughs> I'm just going to lay down on my pillow Alright I think we spoke enough about that episode Let's move on to the next one that we watched uh, Episode 18 or 17 I apologize And a much better episode I thought I'm not here as your commodore But as a comrade in arms Bereft of family Friends And most of the comforts of home I am missing One bowl of fresh Strawberry in thick, heavy cream. Gentlemen, if you know the whereabouts of the stolen fruit, you may place it outside my cabin door within an hour. No questions asked. If after one hour, the strawberries are not returned, I will resume being your Commodore. A shipboard search will be conducted. The guilty parties will be found bound, quartered, and cast overboard. Carry on. Here's the summary for Dear Earth. Mail delivery from Earth brings differing news for the members of the 58th. 
a mission doesn't go well for Damphus. Hawks and McQueen become documentary stars. But who stole the Commodore's strawberries? That summary is courtesy of uncredited. They didn't want their name associated with it. That that's a. I like that they just I grabbed like little like scenes that happened and put that as the synopsis. Like character walks down hallway. Yeah, that was weird. I, I wish someone it. would have taken credit for. It. No, okay. you didn't like it. I thought no, it I liked summarized it. it well. No, it's a good summary. Mm, I don't like it. I I want Keith <laughs> Keith is best to be back. Or what's his name? Keith is best. Keith is me. Keith is me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he just decided this time he's going to be uh, selfless and give this one to the world right, for free. Right. Oh, and let me let me just say, I think that this episode was filmed after this sort of break that we think happened in the show where they got a little bit, either it was an influx of money or something happened because the graphics get a little bit better. The sets are a little bit lit, a little bit There's different. Wides. Yeah. And so I think <laughs> that previous episode we watched was actually filmed I think they're they're airing them in order, not the way they shot them. And uh, this episode, again, was sort of back to, has been the last few episodes where I was like, oh, they're back on this set, which is the bar set that they haven't had before, whatever they call it, pool hall, whatever it is. And again, like even the coloring, everyone just was brighter and I thought it looked a lot better and I was happier with this episode. But let me say before we start, and I know I'm rambling a lot here, this episode tried to do everything. This is maybe... In, in not in an entirely positive way, it's they just jam everything in. Every character has a storyline. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. And there's just so many weird elements thrown in and like a documentary style, but then not. And then this character has a thing and then this one. And it was like, what is happening in this episode? But uh, it seemed like they jammed like six episodes in together. Anyways, that's, you know, that's not why you called. Luke? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give us the kind of the, pr- the, the premise of getting to here is as the show starts, it's looks like a pretty average day in the Saratoga until they see a ship coming in and everyone on the crew kind of gets excited and kind of runs off to the ship. And what we learn is it's the mail ship. I Uh, liked it. I thought it was a good little opening. The mail has arrived. It was great. Well, I thought they set up this thing where I thought they were going to be bodies and then they were... Well, that, that is the Mail. setup, right? You think yeah. it's going to be... Some, and they've done that before where it's the opening. It's going to be something. Oh, no. What's this episode going to be? And this was like a more light. Oh, it's because the mail arrived. That's why they're all showing yeah. up. Yeah. It was, was nice, it, it nice was, opening. It was really good. I've said this before, but this show has shades of MASH. And this episode specifically, there's they take a lot of... Like, I can... As as a big MASH fan, there's almost like four different MASH episodes in here. And that opening was very much like that. Also, hair, Wes got another haircut. He keeps getting his hair shorter and shorter. Did you notice that? I didn't notice that actually. Yeah, he's got he's, his hair's getting shorter and shorter. Everyone's getting haircuts. They start all with long hair, and maybe it's just a mid '90s thing. They're all getting like their friends' haircuts or something. You know? <laughs> Our friends gonna... came out, and everyone got the haircut. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was the Rachel. Well, the he Rachel doesn't quite haircut. have the Rachel. Don't don't get don't get the wrong idea here. <laughs> Wes didn't get the Rachel haircut. I'll get back to where we're going on here. Uh, so they get their mail. Dampus gets like twelve letters from her chef boyfriend, and they all smell like food. Could that really? Would that really work? If I, if Sharon, let's say I'm writing you a letter mm-hmm. and you're millions of miles away, but I work in a diner and I'm like, you know what? I want her to remember that I work in a diner and I wave my piece of papers over my deep fryer or whatever. I don't know if it's going to smell like a deep fryer. You don't know. You don't know until you try, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, next time I send you a letter, I'm going to go f- put it over a deep fryer. And I'll go a million miles, miles mm-hmm. away from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How sweet. Um... <laughs> Wang also gets some uh, mail from home. He gets a book about the Chicago Cubs. And the stupidest package ever. A piece of sod from the Wrigley Field. Sharon, do you think you could mail a piece of... Well, there's a couple questions. One, I don't know if the military would let you mail a big thing of grass, for one, because that's what it was. And two, (laughs) how did they get that off the field? I'm assuming if he's getting from the field, people are still playing baseball on it. So does I guess his parents work there like groundskeepers? You, you know, I don't think so much about those things. No? You you a piece of grass comes in the mail and you thought that seems fine. <laughs> Takes a big sniff Maybe of it. Maybe I'm just very gullible. Maybe I'm just like, yeah, it's possible. To be fair, you were told in grade 6 that it was a PA oh day and then you just and then you just didn't show up. I totally up. <laughs> have so much faith in people. It's so true. You just thought it was really sweet that it'd send grass all the way across the universe so he felt yeah. at home. Grass with still like the roots and dirt hanging off of it. I don't think <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, they Van- don't check. Do they check? I guess they do. It's the military. They'd be reading your letters. Man. Yeah, you wouldn't want to write anything too salacious in those. Well, you got to live your life, right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Even, even in war. Even in a chick yeah. war, you got to live your life. 
Yeah. Speaking of, Vanson gets a letter from her sister, a video message. Yeah, that looks that by the way, the video quality apparently in the future is terrible. I mean, it was also the past. Yes, but it's science fiction. It's the future. And it was like it looked like they recorded on a VHS. <laughs> well, that was probably the case then. It's true. Actually, this is very funny because this happens a lot this episode. I think it even happened another episode too. They keep referring to cameras as digital cameras. That's true. Yeah, they, they, they did it a couple times. Mm. Anytime they have to remark on a camera, they're like, it's a digital camera because it's in the future. Yeah, because you don't, you don't want people thinking oh. that they're using film. Too expensive. It's just very funny. It's like if today I said, Sharon, don't forget to bring your digital camera with you. <laughs> I'd be like, that's redundant. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's my point. <laughs> and in this video message, she learns that her sister's pregnant, about to have a baby, and she's going to name the baby after their mom, which is very sweet. But which Sharon, is not. Why is she so mad? Because it was, she, it was her name. She wanted to use it. Yeah, Vanson wanted to name her own baby after her mom. So she's very mad at her sister this whole episode. Also, we've but never it's had... it's her mom's name. But so she wanted to name her baby that, which is totally fair. I'd be really mad if my sister took a baby name of mine. But if it's their mom, isn't that fair game? That's a question for you. I honestly, I, I thought this was actually a reasonable conflict. But, I, I, you know, my brother and I never talked about baby names. It's just not a thing that probably happens amongst boy children. Mm-hmm. So I, that's why I, want, I was curious for your perspective, if that was reasonable, unreasonable. I mean, as a woman, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. have names for babies. But you would be mad. <laughs> but you seem to think it is unreasonable that her sister would take the name. But because it's their mom's name, maybe it's not. Yes, because it's your mom's name. You could like, that makes sense that you would want to name your kid after your mom or your grandma, especially if she passed, passed away. away. So, yeah, it seems a little weird that she's so mad about that. And what was it? was Marianne. That's what she wanted. Yeah, she wants to name her daughter Marianne. Also, it's very presumptuous. You're right. How does she know she's even going to have a daughter? She might have only a son. Exactly. But uh, we did miss the point that they sort of tried to hint that it's a little sad because the, the um, tanks don't get uh, yes. mail because they don't have any family. Hawks and McQueen are very sad because they're not going to get a letter from home because they don't have any family because they're little in vitro babies. Mm. yeah that's why they were that's why it's like it's a sad day for them right. also uh what's because they're in vitro uh babies hawks at one point didn't know what christmas was either oh yeah sad right so sad <laughs> you're not sad for him at all <laughs> but this is also where this episode crosses over with the last christmas. episode mm-hmm. is uh west gets a letter from home yeah and it's no one's told his parents that his brother is dead yeah yeah that's Super awkward. That is awkward. Well, that's an awkward uh, conversation to have at any time, especially during a chick war. <laughs> no? Well, I was more, I yeah, yeah. when he got the, the, I think we're maybe jumping ahead, but. That's fine. The letter that he was very upset about the, the form letter. Oh, yeah. I mean, as the episode goes on, he's trying to fight for someone to send a letter to his parents because what mm-hmm. he finds out. We can just do this now. We'll get through West's story right now. And we'll come back to the rest of them. That's a good way to do it. Because each of the characters have a storyline. Well, I've got that. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, Luke. Don't you ever doubt him ever I know, again. I know. I shouldn't have done it. I don't know what I was thinking. Don't I, I really West that up big time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, like you said, Sharon, he it's, it's a big thing about how to get his parents to understand that his brother has died because the military hasn't done it. And what he does, he does some research and finds out that they sent the letter to the wrong Neil West instead of N I or N E I L. They sent it to N E A L West, as the military does. Just just a little clerical error, and they're just going to send a form letter back. Commodore Ross tells him, "He's like, yeah, we'll send him a form letter. That's what we do for everyone." And West is very upset by that idea because yes. you know it's, it's his not brother. good enough. Protocol is not good enough for his brother. It's not good enough for his brother. I, I'm hold on one second. I'm going to pull up my note here about this because uh, he says something very specific about his brother. Oh yeah, he says. That he's upset that he's going to send a formula because his brother fought, defended, and died for a cause he believed in. But that's not what happened when he died. No, his, his brother literally went on one mission and died because he was stupid. I think he gets a form letter. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, like, it was very weird. I'm like, your brother fucked up and died. It's not like he was that much of a hero. <laughs> but I think that was, I hear you totally. But I think that was the writer's way of conveying that finally he accepted his, his brother as his own person yeah his brother's wishes and that he 
he supported him. Oh, that's interesting. His... That's good. I mean, that's kind of them remedying maybe some of the shortfalls of the last episode. Maybe. Or maybe he just... I don't know if it's like a remedy or if it was just a plan that <laughs> he was going to accept it after he died and fight for him. So you think brother. this was all a long plan? All planned? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Sharon, you have a lot of faith. I like it. <laughs> we already talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah... So he ends up writing his own letter back to his parents, which is a very meaningful letter where he kind of mm-hmm. tells them from his bottom of his heart kind of like how he feels about his brother and how they shouldn't read the form letter, read the form letter. And if he ever dies, just to reread this letter and you kind mm-hmm. of see his mother reading the letter as it's pouring rain outside mm-hmm. and she's crying. And she- it's a very, very emotional sequence of uh, You know what I was I was thinking about during that scene is when she's crying, looking out the window, I was like... It's very unnatural for people to cry, like, outright, like, standing tall and looking out. Yeah. When you're crying, you're kind of curled up and, you know, and and I always notice notice these things in film and TV that are done for the camera or for the story. And I'm always, I always debate it, you know? Luke, when you cry, though, don't you always go look out a window for people (laughs) to see you? Oh, it's very exhibitionist. Yeah. I love to cry in public. Yeah. But no, I mean, you're right. It, it It's it a bit of a trope. Really hammering home the emotion yeah. we're supposed to feel. But it's, yeah. But it's it's the same thing as, you know, when there's somebody sitting in the back seat of a car and they're sitting in the middle seat because we need to see them. I hate that so much. <laughs> and it happens all the time. Don't, all the time. Don't you sit on the hump when you're by yourself in the back of a car? No. Do you? When you're in your Uber, you just like sit right in the center. <laughs> So the camera is the best shot of you. <laughs> is it awkward if you get it? Let's say if you're in a taxi by yourself. I've, I've, I've done this before. And I think maybe the first time I took a taxi because I didn't know. I just sat in the front with them. That's weird, right? I used to do that too because I thought it was rude. That's, what, that's the same reason. I thought it was rude to be in the back. But so now I, I noticed that every time... I did that. They were, they'd have to like move all their stuff out. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the follow up question. Why do taxi drivers and I and I suppose Uber drivers and Lyft and all why do they always have so much stuff on the other seat? Is that just to because warn people off? Because they're spending all day in their car and they need it's the, the it's most convenient office. spot, yeah, mm. to put the stuff. Well, that answers that question. <laughs> what did you think? You're just, welcome. Just to like get people to not come front. That's what I thought. <laughs> You thought they were rude. Yeah, right. it's just the same thing like I do at the office. Just pile stuff up. And like, sorry, you can't come by here. It's too busy. There's too much stuff happening. Just keep walking. Here's what Jordan thought. Jordan thought Except the... here's some candy. Yeah. Jordan thought the car was pulling up toward him. Got a look at him. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want this guy sitting next to me. Yeah. They start putting stuff in the seat so Jordan can't get in there. Yeah. And then and... I get in. I go, I don't think so. Move that stuff to the back. <laughs> me we're and sitting you. together. We're enjoying this ride. We're going to be friends. Yeah. How I've was got your a... day? I've got a playlist already. We're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> all right well bring us back to the episode as we mentioned hawks mcqueen never get letters because you know they have no family although mcqueen does mention he's got mail twice in his 20 years in the army one was his divorce papers and one was a letter from publisher's clearinghouse yeah which is still going in the future nice to know they they're surviving in 2064 mm-hmm. <laughs> but this time around they both got their own letter and that letter is to tell them they're about to be famous. So their plot line is there's going to be essentially a documentary crew who are going to be, you know, doing a little expose essentially on the military, or specifically tanks in the military. As I, I don't know if it was supposed to be like a propaganda video or a news video. It wasn't quite clear. Maybe they said it was because a tank had murdered the head of the UN. And so they're trying to like right. counteract that. They're trying to get some good press. That alone could have been an episode, which again, I've seen as a mash episode, which is you know, this behind the scenes kind of look and stuff. And it's, Mm -hmm. you get to see the characters from a different perspective from this, from this camera angle. And I was like, oh, I thought that's what it was going to be. But then it wasn't. And then they would have another plot line of, which we'll get to, of Damfus in her eyes. I was like, oh, that's going to be the show. No, it's still not that. And then it was like, it's going to be about Wes and his brother. Nope, it's not. And this, this was a weird grab bag of just, they just threw everything against the wall in this episode. Everybody got a B plot. Nobody got an A plot. That That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. And what would any Space Bump Beyond episode be if there weren't a mission briefing? Yeah, I know. There always is. Their mission this week, which is very brief, is they're going to go to Planet Memnon and just like blow up some Chig supply depots, basically. What was the planet called? A Memnon? Huh. I never catch the planet names. You're very good at that. Planet Memnon. It was a good one. It was very memorable. (laughs) But what's kind of fun about this briefing, and uh, 
it's something we've talked about on this podcast several times now, actually. McQueen gets up and he addresses something that we, the audience, have been wondering for a while. Mm -hmm. And he says, we've been getting a lot of bitching and moaning about this, but he doesn't care. We're not the Air Force. We're the Marine Corps. We'll do whatever missions we have to. And this is really a comment on the fact that we've been wondering. It's like, in the first episode, they were training to be pilots. Mm -hmm. And for the rest of the series, they've been like, going down to planets and fighting hand to hand. And we're like, are, are they pilots or what's going on here? It was it was a criticism at the time of some people who watched the show and even now of people who are really military enthusiasts mm -hmm. who don't understand. I guess everything in the military is very compartmentalized. And yeah. It's like, well, what, what, what are they? Are they Marines? Are they Air Force? Are they in the Navy? Right. And so this, it seemed like a bit of a comment. I, I wrote it down too, Luke. A bit of a comment to the audience to be like, all right, right. we know you guys are complaining. It's the future, and this is how it is, and that was that seemed what that line right. was. At least I, I, I felt that way. It was definitely I a comment see. on that for sure. He so said, "They're the Marine Corps. Every Marine's a rifleman." That's how he finished that. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of a funny meta comment, and just like, stop complaining about this. It's hard to write this show. We need to find something to do every week. They can't be in a plane every single week, right? Right. <laughs> they go down to the planet, and uh, a couple important things happen here for the episode. But they're there for a very short period of time, and their mission is a success. But the two very important things that happen are Wang steps in some glowing green goo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they get attacked, and Dampus gets blinded in an explosion. Yeah, it, it uh, the explosion hits her in the face and shatters her goggles, the stupid useless goggles they can't see it if they're, they're wearing again, and they shatter and go into her eyes. And so now... As we mentioned, everyone kind of has their own B-plot. So I'm going to like veer off from the general episode. Let's just talk about Damfus's episode because she's been blinded on this planet. She's got all these notes from her boyfriend. Yeah, and she loses them. That was the biggest thing. I was like, oh, no. And then they don't ever talk about it again. Well, I think it might be because when she's blinded, she's with Wang and she's very upset because she hasn't finished reading the letters. And mm -hmm. she could die down there now. She may never see again. And she, she begs him to read the letters out loud so that yeah. she knows what her boyfriend was saying to her. And it's very, it's a fun scene and very funny because Wang starts reading them and then he stops. He's like, uh, maybe we should uh, come back to these later. He, uh, Wang did exactly what I would have done in that situation. If I saw, because what we're saying is he starts reading the letter. He realizes it's a Dear John letter when the guy's breaking up with her. And so he's just like, let's skirt this issue so we don't have any crying. I would have done the exact same thing. I said, and he says, uh, you smell great. Anyways, that's all he says. <laughs> all right, let's get you back in the ship there, blind girl. But she won't take it. She needs to know what happened. So Wang is forced to read a letter where her boyfriend breaks up with her as she's blind on this planet. And worst of all, like he breaks up with her to hook up with her college roommate. <laughs> Who he's hired at the diner. That's that's the what happened. Yeah, something like that. It was very awkward for poor Wang. And of course, she's very distraught. Wang has to go get medical help so someone can come, like, pick her up. While he's gone, her senses, I guess, are heightened, or we're supposed to believe that. And she starts, like, firing wildly like she might be hitting chigs. But mm. nobody's there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing I thought. And, Sharon, here's something that they've only... Weirdly, this this show's actually had one real strength, which is they're very consistent with things. They will drop something in, like, episode three, and in episode seven, they'll pull up. They'll pull it back up, and you, and you realize, oh, that's why they mentioned this. And the mm -hmm. show's been very consistent like that. But one weird thing they haven't been good at is... One episode, several episodes ago, Dom Foos, the character who gets her eyes injured, they have her like get a like a superpower essentially. Like she oh. can kind of see auras if something bad's going to happen, mm. but they've never gone back to that. Like she's psychic. She has she has second sight. Well, that's that's what it is. And but like I I was sure that's what they were going to play with here that she's lost her eyes, but she now she still has this ability, so mm. she still can be a functioning soldier. But they don't do that at all. They just never mention that. Yeah, she's just blind. They they completely ignore the fact that they established she can see without vision. Yeah, that yeah, that and that's that's what I thought was weird. <laughs> Interesting. They managed to bring her up back up to the Saratoga. They're going to repair her eyes because in 2064, docs can repair anything except what Sharon. What's the only thing a doctor can't repair in 2064? A broken heart. A broken heart. Yeah. So sad. She's yeah. she's lost the love of her life, and now she's blind. And that doctor though is uh, he's got a real bedside manner, huh? Oh, uh, the the handsome nerd doctor. Yeah, I liked him. Weirdly, the show has like these kind of secondary characters in this episode. We're we're probably more interesting than the actual core it's cast. True. <laughs> this this doctor who's treating her, they they cure her eyes, and this is kind of the. It's very weird. She gets broken up with. She gets blinded. They fix her eyes, 
in like a couple minutes. And like, it, I thought that was going to be something that was drawn out. Like, mm. again, that's a mash episode where Hawkeye gets his eyes injured. You don't know if he's going to be blind or not. That was a whole episode. I thought it was going to uh-huh. be the same thing where I'm telling this is like literally it's like four mash episodes jammed into one. But I thought that was going to be her thing. Like, maybe she's never going to see again. But they're like, she got her eyes injured. Yeah, she's fine. She's I was like, well, why it. do we even do that scene? We didn't really learn anything. She could have had the scene, the paper read to yeah, her. Yeah, it's true. There was not a lot of. Yeah, it was just she was injured and then she, she was opening her eyes and then it was going to be blurry for And a then while the doctor and... was like, ooh, he made some... Jo- oh, he made, what was the joke he made? I he, wrote it down. He gives her shades, like sunglasses to is. wear because her vision will be harmed for a bit. And he's a little flirty, actually. BCGs. Yeah. He offers her glasses and he says, these are BCGs. Do you, do you remember what BCGs stand for? What the medical term BCGs means? No. Birth control glasses. What? What yeah. are those? He gives her those dark glasses and he says, these are BCGs, birth control glasses, because no one's going to hit on you while you wear them. Oh, <laughs> I re- yeah. You know why? You were laughing so hard when the joke first happened that you don't even remember because you just, you missed all the rest of you the dialogue. That's out. why, that's why you've forgotten about it. Yeah, you laugh so hard. You actually, <laughs> the blood pressure fell out of you. You just oh passed out and gosh. fell to the floor. I actually do remember him saying that and... Yeah, I thought that was going to be <laughs> I thought he was going to ask her out and we were going to get like closure around that story. And that, like this kind of handsome nerd doctor was going to like now ask her out. And then she's like feeling better about getting broken up with. But it's going to just end her plot. Like her story's over at that point. She just got sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we gave her two minutes. All right, she's done. Also, uh, the sunglasses I have look a lot like those glasses. So uh... <laughs> you didn't like oh, that. No. Huh? I'm like, mm, those are my sunglasses. <laughs> 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 I don't care for this comment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, it's very odd. Her plot kind of just stops now. And this is probably halfway through the episode. They're like, we're done with her. On to the next subplot. Yeah, I've said it again. This is such an overstuffed episode. Was it's it weird. Halfway? I think that was farther than halfway. It might, it might have been a little further, but it was well before we got to the end. It was kind of around the midpoint, but before the third act for sure. I'll move on to the next character subplot. And I think we'll do Wang next. Okay. Because his is very simple. While he was on the planet... He stepped in green goo. (laughs) And when he comes back up, they're like, we need to quarantine your boots. So they take his boots away so they can test the material that he stepped in because it's some weird alien green goo he stepped in. And he spends the rest of the episode requisitioning new boots, getting new boots, but they're too big, getting new boots, but they're too small. He's like the Goldilocks of boots. I don't think there have ever been lower stakes for a character's plot line. (laughs) Uh, Is he going to get boots that fit? And it was like, they just didn't know, I guess, what to do with him. And it's nice he got a little plot line, but it was like, and and it's, I, it it adds a little bit of like levity to the show, but yeah. it was just like, what what why who cares? But it's cares like a what day in the life. It is know? like a day in the life. It was good. I thought it was fun because there wasn't a lot more room for plot because, as you said, it's pretty overstuffed. But his little thing is every time we caught up with him, he was just like dealing with this annoying thing that he needs new boots. When you're in the army, you got to wear your boots all day. Mm-hmm. But at the end, the military finally returns his original boots, so all is saved, and they uh, let him know what he stepped in on the planet. What was it, Jordan? Chig poop. He stepped in chig poop. Yeah, and they still smell, but they are very soft. That that uh, what I <laughs> I wouldn't even say it. That's that's some valuable uh, poopy stepped in though. You know that, right? I, I was very interested to see how this worked into your your chig economy theory. Well, they know that humans don't think it's worth anything, but he just doesn't realize what a gold mine he stepped into. Almost quite literally. Jordan, I knew you would be very excited about an episode. I was excited. They talked about chick poop. And it's, a, it's a funny little thing. It ends up the whole time. It's like, oh, no, what did he step in? And it was poop. And I was like, oh, OK, that's a little dumb little joke. It was OK. <laughs> it was all right. He stepped in chick poop. It was fun. Yeah, yeah it was fun. But that, yeah, that's his whole it's plot. It's a moisturizer for boots. Yeah. Then that's the, yeah, the joke he makes after. He's like, oh, yeah. my, my boots are so supple now. But that's his whole plot. His whole boot plot ends when you stepped in poop. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. It was great. So let's move on to uh, McQueen and Hawks and their little in vitro documentary they get caught up in. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. this is maybe cute. one of the more fleshed out plots that are happening. Because as they get off the plane back from this mission, the documentary crew is waiting to start shooting this documentary. And uh, who's who's making the documentary, Jordan? Did you notice? I, I don't mm-hmm. know what the actor's name is, but I know he played Banya in Seinfeld. Yeah, Kenny Banya from Seinfeld yeah. is making a documentary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I recognize that guy. I was, I, I was made me very happy. It was very funny to watch that character. Did any of us look up what his actual name is, though? No, I just looked up Kenny Banya. I'm like, yeah, it's just was... Banya. Anyways, that's all you need to know is Banya from... <laughs> it's gold, Jerry, gold. <laughs> um, and do you notice the camera guy who's following around all the time? He's wearing these weird glasses with, like weird lenses on the front i didn't notice that oh they're like they're like what a jeweler a jeweler would wear they're like magnifying glasses on the front of glasses and i'm like 
How does that work? In Tech War, remember there was a camera crew? Was that wasn't it? Didn't they have a weird camera guy in that too? But they didn't have a. This camera guy actually has a big camera on his shoulder, and then in these glasses, in addition, in Tech War, the camera guys just had like Google mm. glasses. Oh right, right. Maybe yeah. it's a viewfinder. Oh, maybe it is. A view, maybe he just looks at his viewfinder remotely through the glasses. Oh, oh it's the fu- it is the future. <laughs> They're shooting digital in the future. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Hawks is pretty excited to be part of this documentary. Uh, they actually call him Lieutenant Hollywood because he's going to be a yeah. big star. But uh, I think it's because he's never had much attention. Attention. He's like can't believe that someone cares about him enough to like send a camera crew up. Some extra who we've never seen before kind of talks under his breath as he walks by and calls him a calls him a, a dumb tank as he walks by. I love I love that this character was brought in this episode just to be a jerk to just say nasty things. That's that's all you need to know about the character. He just is a jerk who says mean things. When he walks by and he uh, says he mumbles under his like dumb tank. What, what is that? Uh, because the camera crew turns to the Hawks and says, what did he say? How does Hawks cover it up? Do you remember? Oh, he says, <laughs> I think he says like, oh, he said he used to work at a bank. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah, that's what it is. Like, dumb tank. Uh, he said he used to work at a bank. Because he's trying not to have it look bad. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. He's, he's trying to make it look like he's a popular guy in this ship. At some point, anyway, the documentary crew corners McQueen and McQueen finally gives them a story. Like they're like, you've been in the military for a while. And it kind of gets into sort of the systemic racism and like problems with these in vitros in the army. And McQueen tells this story in a flashback about how when he first joined the military, some sort of like gross negligence happened. Like they were tanks were just given the most dangerous jobs. What I liked about it was one that this, as we said, this overstepped episode, they still they were able to fit in a flashback. But what I liked in the flashback was because McQueen quite obviously has very light hair, white hair. And so in the flashback, you know, instead of just dyeing the, the actor's hair, like just put a toque on him. So, <laughs> so everyone's wearing, everyone's wearing toques. So you don't know what color his hair is in the past. But yeah, you, you get the thing that there was this negligence and uh, a bunch of people died and no one cared about it. And uh, and he was punished. Oh, well, he was he was, was he stuck. He was uh, in solitary confinement or something. That was he, he, was. he assaulted a commanding officer trying to save the tanks who were in trouble. And he got 120 days in solitary confinement. But he says he could have been ki- like they could have given him a lethal injection for such an infringement because he's such a second class citizen that right. he has no reason to hit anyone. And this guy who did the, who locked these tanks and let them die, he gets no uh, no repercussions whatsoever. Right. Because, yeah. And that's your classic tank thing that they're just seen as disposable. They're not seen as like real humans. He tells this very meaningful story, and now Hawks is sort of feeling like, maybe I'm, like, putting on airs, I guess. I'm not sure, what, like, what happens basically is this racist character walks by and kind of says he's glad those tanks burnt up. Or, like, he's, what does he say? He makes some sort of joke about torch tanks. Yeah, he just, he well, he makes a rather insensitive comment about how he just, he's glad they're all dead. And then, so, which really irritates Hawks, because he's more of a hothead than McQueen is. And so he just decks the guy and just beats the crap out of him. And then McQueen pulls him off and says, hey, like, cool down. And he just kind of quits the documentary. Right? Like, he walks down the hallway and never goes back to the documentary. Yeah, I know. They just they sort of just yeah. dropped that plot line because it was like they were ordered to. They had to do it. So like, OK. And then they go, eh, we're just done with it. And that's that's how it that's. But there is a funny line because they have like this emotional scene, the two of them together. And then he and yeah. Hawks is like. I just thought I would be somebody. And then and McQueen's like, you are somebody. I was like, OK, guys, enough. <laughs> I'll have that conversation with you later. Yeah, so we don't need to. <laughs> you are somebody, Joy. Yeah, I was like, huh, sure. Yeah, okay, move on. Not even you believe that. No, I don't believe it either. Let's just, you know, let's get back to flying ships, you know? <laughs> this, flying a ship. This plot just <laughs> ends right now. They never come back to the documentary crew. In fact, the only time we see it again is right at the end of the episode. They're all sitting around watching a cut of the documentary. Yeah, yeah I know. It's Quick weird. turnaround. Yeah, like they were how, under they were under a tight deadline. How did they get from the edit suite to like this finished copy so quickly? Well, the ship is so big. I'm assuming they also have an edit suite in it. It's the future, guys. So, <laughs> the full time editor waiting and ready to go in well, camera you know, edit. Yeah, self edit. That, that's what it is. It's the guy with his little glasses. Yeah. He's also editing while they're going. <laughs> they cut it, put it in, cut it. Great. He has a new union position. It's camera operator slash editor, and he just does it while they go. <laughs> And anyway, we got to see this documentary they've cut. And you're right. It just turns out it's just like a piece of propaganda. They're showing it to McQueen and Hawks. And like, there, it was just a voiceover saying, in the military, there is no prejudice. Yeah. It was like, all right, well, that was, I don't know why you needed their approval to do this documentary. But that's that plot line. Yeah. And it kind of wraps up it. And so we kind of get to the final and my favorite plot line of the episode with Vanson and her sister and this baby name. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? I agree with but you. But also the strawberries. Yes. Very important part of this plot point. Mm-hmm. 
You agree with me? This is the best one. Yeah, but I don't know if we if it's if we have the same reason why we like it so much. But we'll. And we probably do. She's still pissed off at her sister ripping off her baby name, so she storms into the video phone room where she there's a huge line of people waiting to use the video phone. And when she goes to look at the, I guess they ha- they all have a place in line. And this book, I actually really these are the things I wish the show did more of. And this is yeah. probably just a personal thing. I like this little bit of world building on the show, which is it's the military. Every now and then they get letters and they have to wait for it. And you understand why the characters, it's, it's important to them. And then also stuff like this, that on the ship, you can't just make a call to someone. You have to line up and it's a big pain and all these sort of things that build this world of what these characters have to go through. I liked it. And I, and I know it's, it's weird and I'm sure it doesn't jive with other technology we've seen in the show, but I, it was, I just like the dumb thing that in the military, you got to line up forever. And it's like that classic thing everyone's had that you are in a rush and then you look and there's a line of a thousand people. That was the basic feeling they're trying to have that she has this really important thing, but everyone else also, you know, feels the same way. And they're also in line with their very important thing. Yeah. She's 154th in line for the phone. But here's, here's the thing about that. She wants, she's very angry and she wants to get in front and she's kind of making a big scene about it. And everyone's like, Hey, we're important too, you know? But with the weird thing is she stops and starts talking to a guy and, and so he goes, I'll let you in line essentially if you get me something. And his request is he wants strawberries and cream and he's kind of gross no, about his no distri- no he doesn't he say wants that strawberries with rich thick heavy cream that's Jordan. what i was gonna say he almost describes it in a gross way but here's <laughs> but here my point is he wasn't first in line why didn't she just go okay i can't do that and i'll go talk to someone else in line like why did she decide he would have to be the one person she had she could bargain with the only one who would talk to her i guess but yeah this guy basically offers her a spot in line for this trade basically and yeah, you're right. Why didn't you talk to him? I don't know. I did like this guy says like, you either deal with me or by the time you talk to this, your sister about this baby name, the kid will be a teen with pimples and wearing dumb clothes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think teenagers. Teenagers. They always just wear dumb clothes. Yeah. Every, well, it doesn't matter. Every generation, even in 2064, yeah. they'll be wearing The adults stupid. never get it. The, what do you think the cool teens are wearing in 2064? Hmm. Boxes. Hmm. <laughs> well... <laughs> Because of that Kanye song. They're wearing boxes? <laughs> That's still going to be a trend? I don't it's a, know. It's retro. That's the first thing that came in into my head because I was like, I don't understand that. In 2064, <laughs> 2018 is big. It's yeah, back. It's ba- yeah. It's back. And the Kanye song is a classic. Kanye has, hasn't embarrassed himself in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, so Vanson needs to get these strawberries now. She doesn't have access to strawberries. So she's reluctant to turn to the black markets. She, uh, it's implied that she tries to go through some proper channels to get herself bumped up the phone line. And what happens is McQueen walks in with his letter in his hand. And she's like, yes, here it is. My phone calls come in. And when he opens it up, she, he announces to her that you've been promoted to captain. Yeah, but she's really Which, irritating. Is that random? Well, she's always been their leader, but okay. she's never, I guess, been, I guess she's just never had a higher rank than them. She's just been kind of their unit commander. Right, mm-hmm. right. But like, this is actually a huge deal. Like yeah. she's getting promoted to captain. And she was not happy. It was not what she wanted. She's very let down by the fact that she's promoted to captain. Yeah. But just help her because now she finally decides she's going to talk to the man who runs the black market on the ship. Mank, Mank, Mank. I love this character. <laughs> Did you catch uh, what she described Mank as? How she described his character? It wasn't. I know it was not in a flattering way. Vanson calls Mank a disgusting piece of black market spooge. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, right. She says spooge. I thought she actually said splooge at first, which isn't any better, but yeah, spooge. Not a compliment. No, it doesn't sound like it. Do you think that's future slang or was that 1990s slang? I think it's 1990s slang. Yeah, me too. I feel like I've heard that before. Spooge? Yeah. Hopefully not about yourself. No. <laughs> But Jordan. we're not here to talk about they, me. They said, they, they, they said that then when, when you were when you were off that day. They're like, "Where's Sharon? Oh, she's such a spooge. She just listened to that. <laughs> listen to that kid. She didn't even show up." <laughs> that works. Thanks. <laughs> That's why guests love coming on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just because I just insult them all day. <laughs> but yeah, she's gonna go to this guy for black market stuff. She knows it'll work because somehow. Mank got Wang a deep dish pizza, a Chicago deep dish pizza on the ship, so he, she knows he can trust him. Yeah, it makes no sense at all, but they're just they're just going hard in that he's he's able to get stuff that seems impossible. He's he's that character. Yeah, he looks like a real creep. So how can he not get anything you want on this ship? Yeah. And in order to get these strawberries, she's forced to trade him her brand new 
captain's latrine card. That's what he wanted. A nicer toilet is paper that, is what he mentioned. Yeah. Is that weird? Why would he, what is he going to do that with that? I think the implication is that maybe the captains get like nicer bathrooms. Oh. Yeah. Like a He's higher- wanted a nicer bathroom. I, I thought actually really, because when he got it, I thought it was like, oh, it's kind of showing his world that now he has this to trade with. But then it, it, immediately they drop a line about how he just likes the toilet paper. So I'm like, oh, so it's just for his gentle butthole. <laughs> It's going to be such nice quilted cool toilet paper and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. You don't like nice toilet paper? No, I, I'm I'm fine with it. But if I'm someone who works on the black market, I'm assuming that's going to be more worthwhile to trade to someone else, let alone think about your own sensitive butthole. That makes sense. But I don't think we all have our needs, you know? It's true. I just really wanted to say butthole as many times as I could. That's that's your need. <laughs> yeah, that is my need. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I would have traded for. <laughs> But yes, this is how she ends up getting this no questions asked strawberries in rich, thick, heavy cream. She walks it back to uh, this character. His name's Bozberg, this new ensign yeah. we've never met before. He's like, but she gives Bozberg his strawberries. Because of this, she finally gets to the front of the line. She calls her sister and she manages to get through to her on the video phone in the middle of her childbirth at the hospital yeah and not only i that, was like the video is phone, the phone is the video phone somehow attached to the ceiling so you have yeah. that weird angle i know yeah. it was dumb i was like oh that's the future <laughs> yeah maybe just the wormhole opened i'm wondering like if, no matter where you are some people can reach you <laughs> maybe in the future we don't carry phones anymore there's just like video phones on every wall and when you try to call someone it just like finds you finds you the no- nearest oh, video even better maybe it's just like an orb that like floats up beside you and it's always just around your phone just floats around iPad. you well it didn't look floaty <laughs> that's true i'm sorry i'm just i'm just i'm just throwing ideas out we don't know what it is <laughs> but she gets to watch her niece get born live on video phone yeah it was gross and she was her i found her reactions very strange what's that because she was like upset. I know. I, I agree with it Sharon. Was it was like there was weird reaction shots. She looked like she was confused. You couldn't tell if something. it might just be. I hate to say it, it might just be the actress who I think can do one thing, which is like I'm a tough military woman. Is she grossed out that she's watching this, or is she angry that yeah. she missed the beginning? Like it wasn't quite clear because she just looked kind of constipated the whole time. Yeah, I don't blame the actress. I blame like the direction or something. It's like. Yeah, I just have had no idea what she was feeling, and she it felt like she was offended that her sister was giving birth in the moment that she decided to call. Yeah, maybe maybe she was just irritated at the bad uh, video quality because it was all staticky. <laughs> it's a very good point because it was like I guess what was supposed to happen here is she was supposed to change have a change of heart about giving her sister the baby name, but it never yeah it definitely no. doesn't land very well. I don't think it happens there. I think it happens during the letter. Right, because she writes a letter after mm-hmm. watching the baby being born. And it, but even the letter is fairly confrontational. Yes, it start, exactly. Well, it, it but then it starts way. confrontational, and yeah. then she's like okay with it at the end. Yeah, yeah she, it's like that thing, like you just you say all these nasty things. You're like, but even though I feel that way, I still love you. It's like, well, yeah. you just said all mean things, though. Yeah, <laughs> it, I mean, that's the point. I guess the letter, is she's just like, you can still use the baby name, even though I'm upset about it, but my life is in the military, so that's why it's okay. Yeah. Sign captain. Sign captain. I'm a captain now, by the way. And I mean, that kind of wraps up her story. But let's get back to the very important strawberries because their storyline is not done yet. And who would have thought the strawberries really operate in two different uh, storylines? Yeah, we think it's all done. Vanson's got our phone call. And then we cut back to our friend Ensign Bosberg. And he's now sitting in the, I guess, the uh, cafeteria. Yeah. Common space. With his strawberries and thick heavy rich cream and he's just staring at them and all these people have gathered around all these non-characters have gathered around and they're like he's just looking at them he hasn't eaten them why i was like he can hear you (laughs) (laughs) he's sitting right there and he reveals to us that why was he waiting in line for the phone share because he was gonna propose to his girlfriend and then he chose the strawberries instead yes he sits there and says marriage or strawberries Mm mm-hmm I chose strawberries. He's so distraught. He he knows he made the wrong choice. It's a real moral a moral quandary. I thought I thought that he was upset because he is recognizing that the woman that he wanted to marry isn't the right woman for him because he uh, chose strawberries over her. I think you you could be right actually. That maybe makes more sense than what I thought. <laughs> that I I assumed he 
thought he did something rashly and now was regretting it. But you're right. Maybe he's just like... He's just like, no, my relationship is over because I chose strawberries. I love strawberries more than I loved her. Yeah. Oh, that probably makes more sense. But And that's why he's sitting there staring at them. It's like, it's quite upsetting. Yeah. I think Boesberg is just a bit of a bozo. <laughs> Huh? Huh? You just wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah. I was I, literally while you guys were talking, I'm like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. What are they saying? They're almost done. Yes, just like bozo. The got it in. Now you have to say butthole in the same yeah. sentence. Yeah, that that bozo is a real butthole. <laughs> yes. Got it. Came out. Nailed it. Yeah. As he's sitting here having this moral quandary over these strawberries, uh, Commodore Ross, the commander of the ship, walks in. He's very jovial. He's he's very like, I'm just here amongst you as one of your own to let you know that somebody has stolen my strawberries in rich, thick, heavy <laughs> cream. And I have one hour for those to be returned to me, no questions asked, or I'm going to launch a ship-wide investigation let to where my say, strawberries went. If you had someone, let's say, let's say you're Commodore Ross. Sharon, you're Commodore Ross. Yeah. And you have a special order of strawberries. We don't need to get into why he's the only one who gets strawberries, but let's say you have your own strawberries. Someone has now stolen that food. Would you now want it to come back an hour later, no questions asked, and just you would you eat those strawberries? <laughs> if someone stole my food and came back and go, Oh, here's your strawberries again, and they're and they're and they're covered in a <laughs> thick cream, I'm not eating those strawberries. Here's the thing. He mentioned the strawberries were already in cream. He knew they were in cream. Someone stole them like that. Right. Isn't that so... Con- that's so funny. Maybe it's a common thing that he always gets. He's always getting pranked and on. And maybe... Maybe... What's his name? Bozo? <laughs> no, Bozo Man. <laughs> yeah. Or Bozberg. He knew of their existence. That's so why that's he why was he craved craving them. them. Oh, smart. But my point is, would you eat those strawberries if someone returned them an hour later? If they were that rare, maybe? No, I wouldn't go near them. <laughs> I wouldn't not go even, near him. I not even if they him. were not even if they were rich, thick, heavy cream. <laughs> if you were not no, a well liked person, then you wouldn't want to eat those. Oh, it says more about you than it does about the strawberries. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. <laughs> it's one of those. I'm saying my riddles. enemies are gonna try to kill me with my strawberries. My love <laughs> of strawberries. Uh, and it's at this point that my favorite moment of the episode happens, because he's giving this speech about where the fuck are my strawberries. And the camera like hard cuts back to Bozeman, this low angle, and he's fistful shoving strawberries into his face, like shoving them in his face as fast as you can, trying to scarf down these strawberries before anyone knows he has them and they get taken away. Also, suddenly and, the bowl is just, it was a way bigger bowl because he's jams a lot of strawberries in his mouth, way more than I think could have been that bowl. Do you think so? Oh yeah. Cream dripping out of his was, mouth. You know, the whole time during that scene, I was wondering if I bought that Ross wouldn't see him. Well, but actually, they did a pretty good job of the camera angles. They did do a couple of follow-up shots where you could kind of see how far back he yes, was in the room. and not looking at And he's it. turned away to his, like, kind of back to him. And you can, like, tell he's trying to hide what he's doing as yeah. he just shoves strawberries yeah. into his mouth. It's got to be my favorite thing I've ever seen is a man just shoving <laughs> fistfuls of strawberries into his mouth. But here's the thing. You know what he could have also just done? Just slid the strawberries away from him on the table. And then you go, no, hey, look, he Jerry, Jerry has strawberries them. and just sell out old Jerry, you know? No, but he wanted to have them. Obviously. He gave up a relationship for them. Yeah. That's true, I suppose. He needed to eat them. He like, couldn't lose them. What if he got them. caught? What if he was caught? It was time sensitive. If he saw them, he would have taken them and he got in trouble. No, I'm saying blame it on someone else. No, but he still wouldn't be able to have the yeah, strawberries. You can't lose the marriage and the strawberries. You're right. No. That's true. You always do say that, Luke. Can't lose them both. Yeah, you can't lose the marriage and strawberries. <laughs> but I, I honestly, I love that scene so much. I went back and watched it a couple of times. It was, was a real. It was so that was hard. my favorite scene too. It was a real bit of broad comedy on the show. I, I could have that Bozberg in every single episode and be very happy. Is he a new, just a random new? Yeah, you've totally never random. Seen him before? And they gave him so much to do. The, in the show episode. does this oh, all the time. Cool. They have characters who show up, and then they sort of introduce them, and either they'll die or they'll just kind of go away it's a very wow, weird thing they that's do a, that's like a, a lot of story for a oh yeah small that character that actor great week for him he got mm-hmm. like a huge part in the show yeah and a great part as far as i'm concerned yeah um but that i mean that wraps up the episode everyone kind of got a weird little b storyline including a bowl of strawberries i hope that mank is a recurring character i like the idea of again a little bit of world building that there's this character you learn there's a bit of a black market and there's a character there who's sort of like cork escort character who's just there to yes has his own his own interest at at heart and i I like that and it's like bring him back oh my gosh he's also new yeah he's new bring back nerd doctor 
I loved him. Your doctor was also new. Yes, all these are characters I've never been in the show for. Oh no way! Everyone is brand new on the show. Almost every episode. That's pretty cool. It's true. I mean, and occasionally, occasionally we'd like to see them come back. So I mean, Mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe they'll start because this seems to be in a late stage of the show where they were trying to build more sub characters. Maybe we'll see them again. I don't know. So, uh, do you have any final thoughts on the first one, Toy Soldiers? And do you want to give it a ten star uh, rating out of ten? Oh boy! Oh man! Oh, it's gonna be hard. Go first, Jordan. Toy Soldiers, Jordan. I didn't think this was a great episode, but I didn't think it was terrible. Um, and also, I'm gonna be a little bit more generous because again, I watched it at midnight last night when, after I was really tired. So I'm gonna give it a six. <gasps> yeah. Do you think that's too high? <laughs> no, that's okay. You can give it a low, sir. I was gonna give it like a three. Oh, well, you know what? That's a good. That's interesting to see someone who's never seen the show before. That that's the reaction. What do you think, Luke? You know what? I'm on Sharon's side. I think it's a. I think it's a four for me. I wow. There's a bunch of things they could have done to improve it. Like I would have loved it if he didn't die and got car There's like ways it could have been a more stronger episode. It just didn't work for me at all. Right. It felt like a throwaway. Mm. It was a bit of a throwaway. I think maybe my review is a little high. I don't know why. <laughs> Now Jordan, I'm second. I'm really sorry. I thought that myself. you were gonna be so harsh. You were like, oh. Luke's much meaner than I am. Really? Oh yeah. Hmm. All right. So Sharon, what about what do you think about Dear Earth, our subplot Second. packed episode? I'll give that a five. Five. Oh wow. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So definitely not a show you would have watched. No. <laughs> Jordan, what do you think? I thought this episode was okay. I thought it was again overstuffed. I'll give it a seven. Which now, as I'm thinking, the first episode's got to be a five. Can I change my me, me, me five? Right. I'll bring I'll bring it down to five. Because this yeah. episode was, I thought, considerably better, but wasn't again way too much happening, too overstuffed. Um, but I did like that we stopped with the dregs of like trench warfare, which I, I I'm tired of those episodes. I don't need to see them anymore. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. I liked a lot of a dear earth. Like there's a lot of like I liked the little subplots. I liked that it wasn't a big story. I liked the, like these little character moments for everyone. And like unquestionably, Commodore Ross's strawberries and Bozeman's adventures with those strawberries. I've never seen anything I've liked more. Ten stars. <gasps> ten, ten stars. stars. Ten stars. Wow. Come on. I would Jordan watch that over just and over again. Said that no Luke way. Is harsh. There's no way that was a ten. I episode. would watch the strawberries get shoved in that man's mouth. Day but that was night. only one scene. This it was is a ten, ten star stars. episode. Ten wow. stars. He's insane. That's insane. I loved this episode oh man it was a good episode but it was like it's not a 10 i mean are we think are we like judging this episode based on in relation to the rest of the show or to the rest of the shows in the world personal enjoyment (laughs) all right this is my favorite episode i've ever watched on this podcast really that's so nice i had such a good time and when it ended the way it ended with those strawberries I was beside myself. Wow, I'm really surprised. That's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Ten stars, that Jordan. I can't believe it's ten stars. There's no way. I don't know, Jordan. You're missing out. I guess. <laughs> now I really want strawberries. So, because uh, <laughs> because you're you reached the uh, the euphoria that Luke was while watching the episode. <laughs> I just like strawberries. <laughs> yeah, everyone likes strawberries. Should I get you some? Uh, Thick, rich, heavy cream? <laughs> it's gross. Ugh, no, no heavy cream. Um, so, Luke, plug into the uh, Continuum of Drag computer there and tell us what our overall score is for the series. Sharon, Ooh. while he does that, um, if it drops below five, we take the escape pod and we never watch another episode of the show again. But I have a feeling this show's average is going to be much higher than a five overall. Well, I gave that episode a ten. So. It's dead ten. So that's going to make sure there's no way we're taking oh the escape pod this week. Goodness. We've the only taken it once. Pod. Really? And what at what episode? It was episode um, 13, was it, of Tech War. Yeah, that sounds okay. right. Different series. Okay. So where are we at, Luke? All right. So the series average for Space Bump Beyond right now is 6.72. Ooh. Yeah, that's so it's nowhere, good. nowhere near that five. No. So fine. Uh, Sharon's ratings really helped uh, keep us down to regular ratings. Yeah. Like. Well, well, your 10 was way too high. Oh, no. We're was, never going to agree I, on that. I will never see a better episode when we do this podcast. It's the best episode we'll ever what watch. If, what if old really? Bozo comes back? And he's eating raspberries this time. <laughs> Whoa, it's double ten. Blueberries. Yeah. What other berries are there? Lots. Bumble bumbleberries. I Lots. would watch a whole show about Bozeman stealing Commodore Ross's berries. It was fun. All day long. All day long I'd watch that show. Yeah. The show uh, there's no question the show can use that sort of levity. There's it, yeah. like it helps. Before we wrap up, Sharon. 
Yeah. You're uh you're a director. Yes. A filmmaker. Auteur. A very powerful <laughs> woman. Not an auteur. And uh, uh, you're 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 one of the most powerful Canadians of all time. <laughs> oh wow. Is there anything uh, you think our viewers um, can might... Can I take away my disclaimer now? <laughs> Believe <laughs> everything that Jordan ever says. <laughs> Is there anything you think our listeners should uh, should check out of yours? Do you want to Well, you I think considering, considering the, the content of this podcast, it's funny because my work is generally pretty grounded and isn't really science fiction-y, but I have these three shorts that I made um a few years ago just on my own on like with my camera it's in black and white and they're all a little surreal and it's called the three short shorts and you can probably google them and find them online (laughs) you should watch those the names are a bad fall the key and which way is happiness you know what i haven't even seen these so i'm gonna go watch those after the podcast oh my goodness i'm very excited and then we're gonna (laughs) review them yeah star them <laughs> yeah star them <laughs> well i hope there's some berries in them because yeah. that's that, what I that, like. if you want to get a 10 you got to have someone jamming fruit in their face for luke <laughs> oh <it's> so funny <laughs> all right well that wraps up the show if you want to send me your fan fiction about commodore ross's berries you can get a hold of us at continuum drag at gmail.com and of course you can follow us on instagram and twitter at continuum drag and thanks again for coming in sharon thanks for having me jordan good to talk to you as always mm-hmm. and listener uh we'll talk to you again next week Bye. I think that's it. Bye. <laughs> Continuum Drag is recorded at Astro Lab Studios in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rick Siedler. Produced by Jordan Delick and Luke Black. Special thanks to Adam Wheatner, Jeff Hanley, and Dwayne Wright. <laughs>